Welcome back to Practice Underwater. My name is George. We're here with Matt, and we have part two. If you heard me last week at the very end of the episode, kind of funny moment. Hopefully they kept it in where I was uh, thought that we were already done with part two, but this is actually part two. So you get an extra episode in my mind this week. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't think George sleeps through these intro outros because he doesn't. So if that came off that way. It's yeah, it was great. just a 12 minute outro, and I was like, okay, this has to be two parts. You know, this is long. <laughs> They need this, George. They need content. I know for myself, I run out of podcasts by like 11 a.m. and then I got nothing to do. Oh, geez. I don't listen to podcasts. I think that's kind of, is that, I think it should be well known at this point. So this interview here was recorded pre-COVID. So we made the joke last time that the AR issue is kind of nice to have right now. If you're wondering why I'm not talking about it in this episode, it's because it was recorded before the pandemic hit the United States. Here we go with Alex. All righty. See, I missed it last week. I threw it in this week. All righty. We're back with Practice Underwater. <laughs> I have with me here Alex. He was cracking up in between segments. He just dropped this great line about how great his communication skills are. I said English is my worst language, but it's the only one I know. Oh, gosh. Crack me yeah, because sometimes uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm trying to communicate something. My assistants make fun of me because I've got three names for every instrument. The lateral condenser, sometimes I call it like an acorn. So I can't remember the other names I call it, but if there's not at least three names, there will be. I'm going to do a quick recap of the last part. This is Alex, obviously not his real name. He said he's in Idaho and he was comfortable sharing that, which is a competitive state. Family-wise, you know, it's where he wants to be. I'm totally on board with that type of decision, by the way. We're really big on sustainability and it's really hard to sustain living somewhere you don't want to be. And so you bought this office in June and in September, uh, you had to let go of a floater that was in charge of a lot of the AR stuff going on in the office. Uh And then um, in November, your front desk kind of approached you said, I'm getting really stressed with the front desk. And then, um, you know, your response was to get some of the assistance helping up there. And uh, AR has kind of been steadily climbing um, to the point where last month uh, you produced like adjusted production of 50 and collections of 16,000. And so the AR situation is like, you know, you have outstanding like three months worth of collections at this point. Um, So it's it's kind of snowballing out of control. And we talked about that last episode. So we're not really going to harp on it in this episode because, you know, from our listeners perspective, two days ago, you started really working on this AR issue. So I don't feel like it's fair to them to to really focus too much time on that. And so I switched gears towards the end of the episode and we talked about your goals and um, you said you wanted to be doing a million in three days a week. And, you know, just the complexities of the conversation around three days a week. Um, you know, it's 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 totally fine if we were coaching. You know, we'd work on getting you to like 1.2 in four days a week, and then we'd cut down to three. Um, it's probably how we end up doing it. So, you know, in this conversation, I think we're going to focus on getting you to $100,000 a month, four days a week. And then from there, um, you know, the cut down to 1 million in three days is pretty easy. So, uh, that's kind of a summary of part one, you know, but if you want to go listen to it, I'd recommend it. Uh, I made fun of him a fair amount, so he was pretty cool about it. <laughs> and um, so yeah. I think that's kind of what we talked about. One thing that you mentioned in part one is you talked about the team. So you talked about wanting to keep your team small and you specifically mentioned four or five team members and your team to recap for our audience is one front desk, one hygienist and three part-time dental assistants equaling one full-time dental assistant. So that is your team currently. And so um, the idea of hiring additional front desk, for example, was kind of an issue for you because you're like, well, I'm going to have a way too many team members. I'm going to have like six. And, um, you know, I, I won't. So I kind of want you to elaborate on that point. Sure. Yeah. I think in a perfect world, I just have you know, one or two assistants, one front desk and one hygienist until Mm -hmm. we grow a little bit. Yeah. Just because like, um, I think it's like a culture thing. The more people, the harder it is to manage the culture, like kind of bad feelings can creep in when there's more people or just like more drama with the dental assistants. I notice it the most. So somebody will come and they'll be like, Hey, where's this instrument? Like, well, we used it yesterday. Like, like, well, it didn't get put back in the right place. And so like, well, what the heck? Why not? So um, I just see that like just the less. And then like when our front desk is gone too, and um, we have one of our assistants as the receptionist, people will call in and they'll ask questions and they don't know the answer. And so I just feel like the more people you add, 
the more complex it is. And granted, we don't have the right systems in place to be like, well, anyone should be able to answer that question or anyone should know where the that instrument is because it should have just one place to go. Um, so granted, the right systems aren't in place. But uh, yeah, I think also just the more people, every time you make a change, um, it's just harder to communicate that up and down the organization and I get it small, but, uh, that's just my feeling on it, George. What, what's your thoughts? So I'm happy you said that because I was looking for, so, uh, the coach in me, right. You said, I want, I have goals for my practice and like in November, you're, you needed somebody up there to help your front desk. And you were kind of resistant to the idea of hiring somebody because of your staff thing that you got going on. You know, but the yeah. reality is like that, you know, so that mindset of the team, like that, uh, your desire to keep the team small in number uh, is ultimately, so that kind of impacted you in November. But then also like for you to reach the size practice you want, you know, you got to add people. So either way, you know, this issue is kind of has held you back in the past this way of looking at it and also uh, holds you back from the future from reaching your goals. So mm -hmm. I think both ways, you know, I kind of see it affecting the situation and what I could see it really offering you is the ability to really um, embrace growth, right? Is It's hard to grow when you don't increase the size of your team. And so ultimately, yeah. you know, that can be a spot that's going to hold you back. And so um, like, <laughs> you kind of said it perfectly. You said two things that really stuck out to me. You said one, um, you know, we have like the assistant. So you have three assistants working one person's job. So yeah. So you're like, well, they they don't know where the girl that was here yesterday put the instrument. And and then you're like, and then when my front desk is gone, you know, the assistant is up there and uh, you know, she has no idea what she's doing. So like the more people you throw at it, but I think both of those things have nothing to do with how many people you employ, but just a lack of organization around their employment, you know? So mm -hmm. um, like, I think your idea that like, and, and right, the solution that you've kind of created in your head is, well, if I just have these three people who never move positions, then I'll never like need organization. Right. Because like, <laughs> they'll always just do it their way, <laughs> you know, right. but like, the reality is, okay, like what if your front desk retires or what if like, you know, then you're like, well, the new person will have to learn everything that she knows so that it will run, you know? And it, it's kind of funny, like, I, you know, I feel kind of like Mark Costas making this point right now because he makes it all the time with the whole Michael Jordan thing that he talks about. But like the reality is, yeah, like this is like, so I think the idea in your mind is you're blaming your staff situation um, uh -huh. on your lack of organization. So you know, without, uh, like, you know, I'm not saying that three dental assistants working one, one full-time dental assistant job is like a great idea, but if you were organized about the way you went about it, you wouldn't really notice, you know, that's as much, um, obviously yeah. chair side, that's like annoying to be working with somebody different every day, but in general, you know, it, it shouldn't be as big of a deal. And so I think my, uh, my point is that your, your team, your feelings about the size of a team and realistically, like I look at your staff and I'm like, yeah, you got a team of three. I still call it a team of three. I don't care how many people actually work there, but like uh -huh. you have three team members on any given day. You have a dental assistant, a hygienist and a front desk. Um, so, you know, you can call part-time people all you want, but um, you really don't have a team of five. You know, I think that that's right. a, that's an illusion. Um, so, you know, that is one point that I do want to make with you. And I think um, again, like, I get it from your perspective, but realistically, are you going to be able to fire any of these people or like, do you ever want to make that type of decision? Um, I could, I like but them all. Though. You like them all. Could you, like, let's just say down the road, you get busier and you need two full-time assistants. Could the yeah, three so, become two? Yeah. So yeah, you could have two sure. people there on any given day. Yeah. Yeah. And you like them all. So, I feel like the, the the assistant setup you have is sustainable. You like them all. They're all great people. And you can have two people on any given day. So you have like two full-time assistants 
Um, just three people have to kind of share that position. And I like that because when one person is sick, you get coverage, like somebody else can come and fill in. I, I in general, I, I tend to, and I've learned to over time, enjoy the, the, uh, the flexibility that that type of like, when somebody takes a week of vacation, you know, you don't have to like run with one column, you know, so there's a lot of benefits to, if you could organize your practice in such a way that the three assistants act like two full-time assistants, then Mm -hmm. it offers a lot for you. So like, let's look at it the other way, instead of complaining about like the instrument situation, like you could think about it, like, well, look at how much it offers for me. Like I can, I can now, I can have one person at home any given day. So if somebody calls out sick, like, Hey, next person up, you know, come on in, you got like a bench, you know, and Uh that's great. You know, how many practices have that? Like on any given day, they have a spare assistant sitting at home who could fill in for anybody that's missing in the front or back, you know, Uh minus a hygienist. Um, That's, that's a huge luxury. And, you know, and hygienists are pretty plug and play. So realistically, like you could be totally covered between like your assistants who could help out in the front or the back and then a hygienist temp agency. And like now, like anybody can miss work and you're still good. Um, uh-huh. You know, because it's really easy to replace hygienists with temps, but it's harder to replace like an assistant or front desk with a temp. So you kind of have it made to have this great setup of, you know, like having somebody on call at all times in case something happens. And I think yeah. that that's a huge opportunity that if you could make this situation a little bit more organized, um, then then you have that opportunity now that most don't. And I think, so one of my assistants is uh, quitting, but she said, if you need me, I can stay on as an alternate, but she does like Airbnbs. And so she's like, I just want to kind of focus more of my time and attention on that and on my kids. And she's like, here's my two weeks notice, but like, keep me on the payroll. Like, don't, you don't have to, (laughs) so she will. So she is actually going to be the bench and then your two will be, so can you make either of those two more full-time? Can they both be full-time? No. And that's what stinks about it. So I, I, but I have an opportunity here to hire somebody that can help me reach my goals, whether that's like an expanded function dental assistant mm-hmm. or whether that's like a part-time receptionist. And so then, then like between another, the two, can they fill in one full-time position? Yeah, the two can. Okay, so but, then you have two that are serving, they're splitting one full-time position, and then you have a, a third who is a full-time, legit four-day-a-week dental assistant or whatever, correct? Uh, we were going to hire a receptionist. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying right now. I'm saying oh, down yeah. the road. Yeah, okay. In a perfect, yeah, in a perfect world. Cool, okay. Yeah. So, um, good. So either way, that whole spiel I just went on, should still apply. It just looks a little bit different, but either way, you should have somebody at home on any given day. So um, you still have that flexibility and you have an extra alternate. So you're, you're building your bench, man. Um, so, <laughs> so then the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was sort of, um, well, I wanted to talk to you about, I guess, you like the idea that like 100, so 100 a month feels really outrageous to you. Why? Um, I just feel like busy right now, four days a week. Like I've been, you know, I've kind of had that 50,000 in my mind for a while. And which you did this past month. Yeah. I produced 57, I think. And then, but adjusted production was 49. So I like adjusted production. I want to be 50. So yeah, anyway, okay. like so, I'm super close. I thought I was going to hit it this month, but dang it, I didn't. So, and do you um, feel super busy clinically? The days that I'm here, yeah, I just feel like um, I only have one hygiene chair, and I I ran two hygiene chairs down in Pocatello. I mean, down in another city I was in in Idaho when I was there. Uh-huh. Um, I was just trying to keep it vague, you know, trying to stay yeah, go secretive for it. here. Keep going. <laughs> No, I don't care. So, um, yeah, and it was, it was busy, but, and now I've dropped down to one and it's been nice. You know, I feel like I have more time to talk with the patients and form a relationship. Um, and I don't, I don't spend more than just a few minutes talking to them. Um, and even less now that I've met him once before, you know, the first six months, I, I asked them to schedule me a little more time just so I could get to know people and, and maintain the goodwill with patients. 
So, and I've noticed the last couple of months I've been able to just make those, those, uh, periodic exams just really quick. Um, but yeah, I, I still feel busy. I don't know if I'm like slow clinically or if I talk too much. Well, I don't know what you, it is. You've kind of already said that you don't delegate anything clinically, correct? Yeah. So if I do a crown, I would love to walk out of the room after the impression is made and let the, cause that's like, it takes me probably, you know, 15 minutes to, to do the temporary crown. It'd be awesome to just have that extra 15 minutes to start up on the next patient. So and like a crown. Currently you don't do that because. Because I don't have like in Idaho, you have to have an expanded function dental assistant to do that is my understanding. Okay. Um, are your understanding from. Just this uh, printout from the Idaho state board of dentistry. Okay, good. So you actually looked up the actual resource. Good. Right. Okay. So, okay. What about like packing cord? Also expanded function? No, you can do that in Idaho without. So I have taught them that, but like. Wait, is it is of, it like fabricating the temporary? Because it's not even like, you're not even working in the patient's mouth. It's totally outside of their mouth. Yeah, I don't know. Or is it I'd adjusting it the temporary? Uh, if you give me two seconds, I can let you know. But I'm currently in, I'm in the middle of it. Um, so let's see. Um, fabrication and placement of temporary crowns. From an expanded function only. Yeah, dental assistant, board qualified, and expanded function. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and so, oh, geez, that sucks. Well, Gosh. yeah, when I listened to that episode... Like this kind of blue, like I knew in Colorado, you know, like, but it just kind of hit me like, man, it'd be awesome to prep a tooth and like have high standards still, but like have your assistant come in. Like I'd audit that because I really care about, you know, what's going in people's mouth as I think most dentists do. For sure. So like, yeah, I would like audit that for the first little while until it's comfortable with the assistant um, placing the restoration. And then I'd walk out and be like, sweet. But uh, yeah, I've got to do, in Idaho, I've got to do it all, especially with no expanded functions. Yeah, so you're kind of in this tough predicament though because you have to get the expanded function. Um, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg, right? Like you need to have, you need to be busier clinically. So you need to check more hygiene so that you can be busier clinically so you can afford the expanded function. Uh, but then you also need the expanded function so you can get a little bit more hygiene checked. Uh, so um, uh -huh. But in general, like I'm saying that as if it's a problem, but realistically, you probably just get the expanded function assistant first. And, um, you know, but anyway, um, so I wanted to make you aware of your recall percentages. So this is the reason why, because you kind of have this idea in your mind that like, I don't have enough patients, so I can't grow my practice enough to be, you know, the larger practice that does a lot of, you know, revenue. Um, but actually, when I'm looking at you, I can tell you've done a residency. Uh, because you do a really good job on case acceptance. You do a really great job with your, like this month, uh, you presented 90K and you scheduled like 53 of it. And I mean, oh, you nice. scheduled you scheduled like $7,500 worth of ortho. Like you, you did really well. You know, your crown ratios are good. Your filling ratios aren't bad. Um, and so I'm looking at your case acceptance in general and I could tell that this is doctor driven. Um, but you know, your hygiene percentage is high, like, or low. So like you're, you're definitely, you're definitely doing good at producing. That is not your weakness. So the idea of you getting to your goals is just a patient flow issue, right? Like you're doing 50K a month off of one hygienist worth of patients. And so the idea is, okay, like I think you and I are both on the same page. You add another hygienist and all of a sudden your 50K a month becomes 100K a month pretty easily. Are you with me on that? Yeah, <laughs> but I feel like I have to work just like with my speed and uh, like not delegating anything. I'd have to work like eight days a week, you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's how you feel that. right now, right? And like what right. what's getting you in the way of that, right? So what objections do you have in your mindset behind that? You have a, a I'm, I'm, I don't have enough time in the day for all of that, right? And then you also have a, I don't have enough patience for that issue, right? Uh -huh. So... Are those yeah, your two feel, objections to that idea? 
I think right now it's time of the day. So your idea that like you can't hit 100K, like really what's holding you back from 100K is getting more organized and efficient on your side scheduling and opening up hygiene capacity and obviously AR, right? Like we don't need to harp on that. But realistically, uh-huh. like you don't need more patients to do 100K. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. So your area, like you being in Idaho, has no impact on your ability to do 100K. Like none. Right. 40%, well, so, like half of your practice has come in for a cleaning in the last six months. The other half yeah. is not. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, I think that's one of the lowest recall percentages I've seen in a long time. Like you have a lot of patients who are overdue for a cleaning. So I would really focus on... So that's on, like, go that's ahead. my hygienist not rescheduling patients or that's just like... No, your hygienist that, is rescheduling patients well. It's just patients are dropping off and there's no system on getting them back. Um, probably because uh, your front desk is a little overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's a little focused on not collecting money to be calling people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, man. Like it's a uh, gosh, I, uh, gosh, the whole like one front desk thing. Like every time I look at a practice and it's like, sure. Right. Like this could be managed by one really great front desk person. It, but you could also have two front desk people who are like, you know, a little bit inefficient, but the amount of money that like they cost versus how much like it, it's hard for me to get behind that lean and mean you know one front desk keep things efficient unless you're really high performing and you've shown me that you can pull it off like just hire enough people to get the job done um you know that's my like it's either okay so we're gonna understaff our practice and not get the job done or we can staff our practice appropriately and maybe not be as lean and mean and efficient and awesome as possible, but at least we're doing the stuff, right? Like you guys reappoint well, but somehow half of your practice hasn't come in in the last six months, you know? So like, um, yeah. And then the whole AR thing, I don't want to get back into, but like, yeah, it, it's just goofy, man. Um, I, I, I'm ripping you on purpose because you can take it and you're funny and we're having a good time. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, but I realistically, called you for, for help, right? Yeah, no. I contacted and, you to help me out. Like, I don't, I've never done this before. Like, I'm not super smart. So yeah, I just go straight to the top. <laughs> and, uh, okay, we're going to forget that comment. And, you know, but in general, right? Like, um, you're in, you have enough patients here. And then, like, the other point that I'll make is you saw 10 new patients this month. And, Yikes, is that all? Oh, but it gets even better. Half of them have no next appointment scheduled. So realistically, you only added five patients to your practice. So Uh like, again, like what can we control and what can we not control? Like we can control how we handle patients when they're in our practice. And, you know, obviously with marketing, we can control how many patients come into our practice. But like right now, you're kind of like of the mindset of my areas keeping me back from my goals. But realistically, it's all the performance of your practice. Like your area is totally fine. Like, I mean, it's not great, right? but you have enough patients here to reach your goals and the ones uh-huh. that you are getting that are new patients, you're not even scheduling anyway. So it doesn't even like, <laughs> like you're shooting yourself in the foot more than your areas. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that would be my approach. Yeah. Like last month, 15 new patients, seven of them made a next appointment, eight of them didn't. So you're not really adding 15 new patients. You're adding seven. And this month you added five. So it's just that idea that like, you know, it's more the concept that I'm trying to get across to you of Uh seeing the opportunities that are within your four walls instead of focusing on the lack of opportunity outside of your four walls. Mm -hmm. Are you with me on that? Yeah. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Like the only thing holding you back from your goals is all your stuff. Like your, your, uh, you know, how booked out you are, how inefficient the schedule is, how hard it is for you to check hygiene, you know, like, it's kind of like um, I'll get, so every once in a while, we'll get a client and we're trying to do something with them and their staff complains. And they're like, well, you know, and then the thing that they always say is like, well, there's so many dentists across the country that are able to, like, there's so many dental offices around the country that are able to do it this way. Like, why can't you do it this way? Like, um, for example, like, you know, two assistants running two columns in some practices can be a problem when they're only used to one column, one assistant. And, mm-hmm. um, so like for me, I'll tell you, like checking two hygienists 
like that should not be a problem. That should feel the way that one hygiene feels for you right now. Cause you feel like you're, you feel like you're stressed right now. Right. Yeah. I often, uh, you could say run behind schedule. Yeah. So you often run behind schedule with one assistant and one hygienist. Yeah. So I think that's more of a you problem than it is like a anything else. You know, like it's not the idea of checking for two hygienists that is the problem. I think it's whatever is the reason why you're running behind with one hygienist and one assistant is making it, you know, it, that's the real <laughs> issue, not the idea of two hygienists. You know, because like I check four and like I can yeah. handle, I, 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 there was a period of four and a half months where I didn't have an associate and I was running three columns of restorative and um, four columns of hygiene. And, you know, that was just me. And, you know, I had expanded function, but like, yeah, those felt like long days, right? Like I felt really tired at the end of the day and I did not like it, you know, but that like, that is a, like, and we graduated the same exact time. So right. like, it's possible. It's just for some reason, right. And I'm in Arizona where I have expanded functions just since I get it. But, you know, in general, I think that there are plenty of dentists in Idaho that are able to check for two hygienists. And so what I would do is, um, I have right. clients do this exercise sometimes where when something is making you slow or something is making you run behind, I want you to get a, a notebook and a pen and like write that thing down. So if it's like a matrix band or if it's a, um, you know, getting an IA or whatever it is that is making you fall behind or making your day stressed or making it not flow the way it should or a temporary or like just think of just make a huge list of like if this did not go wrong. Or if I was better at this, things would flow better because then you'll start realizing all the opportunities to free yourself up clinically uh -huh. um, just by things going better, uh, you know, like realistically, right? Like I'm not saying you have a block problem. We haven't talked about this, but like I had a block problem at the beginning of my career. I was missing a ton of blocks. And so it makes, the, it makes your clinical stress go up and it makes your appointments go over and it's a whole annoying thing. And... Mm -hmm. And it's like, it doesn't, it's not like I need to delegate anything else to give a proper block the first time. It's just, I just need to learn to do it. And, and then I just like really buckled down on getting really good at giving blocks and hitting a bunch of blocks. And then I taught my hygienist. Now I like, I'm the, I'm the block guy in the office. Like when a hygienist misses a block, I'd go over it. And I'm like really good at giving blocks now, but that was a total weakness of mine. And so uh -huh. you have the opportunity again, like let's look, let's focus on the opportunities within our four walls and everything you need to reach your goals can be got within your practice and like really, really take ownership of the areas in your practice clinically where um, you are falling behind or the flow of your practice isn't running well, like really focus on your flow, your scheduling, those things, because there's a lot of opportunity there that you're not, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for growth. And that's ultimately like you want your days to feel easy. And like when I go in and give a block and I hit it, it feels easy, even though, I didn't do anything different than I used to do. I just, now I'm better at it. And so I think yeah. by getting better at running your schedule and checking hygiene and like whatever it is that is causing the issue right now, because you should not feel stressed with one assistant and one hygienist. Um, uh -huh. But the reason you do is your opportunity. So whatever that is, look inside of it and explore it and say like, why did this not go well? And I think you'll start finding some common themes. And there's so many great resources out there. Um, for learning this. I mean, dentists love talking about how to do these things efficiently. That's like the easiest thing to get dentists to talk about is how they place a composite or how they give anesthesia or like their techniques, you know, because we all have that in common. We all do those things all the time. So uh -huh. um, anyway, I went on for a while. Kind of what stuck out to you to that conversation? Um, that notebook thing. I mean, I've got a ton of time to write stuff down because yeah, just the lags in the day. I feel that a lot. And uh it goes better with one assistant. I feel like she's got everything out on the tray, like ready to go, you know, but like today it probably happened three times in one appointment where I like asked the assistant, like asked her to hand me something and it wasn't there. And uh, so she has to go get up, go to the other operatory or wherever it was and get it and bring it back. And so that's frustrating okay. to me. So, so there's a perfect example, right? So you get in your notebook and you write that down, like assistant getting up in the middle of the procedure to grab instrument, right? Three times. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Three times. Right. So that's, that right. is a, and right. We already talked about it. Like, 
lack of organization, right? We already addressed this point. You're like, well, I have three different assistants. And it's like, well, if three of different assistants are doing it the same way, then there's no lack of organization, you know? Um, yeah. So if I had a picture of the tray set up exactly how I wanted it every time and every instrument that I could possibly need. Bingo. Then boom. Yeah. So that would take you like an hour tops to get that set uh-huh. up for like every procedure and you work with your best assistant and you guys do it together. Right. Like the more your staff can be involved in this process, the better in general. So like you go to your assistant, right? Pick one, your favorite. I don't care. And you just say like, Hey, assistant, you know, um, one thing that I've noticed is that there's three of you here and you, you know, you use whatever excuse you want. Like the fact that there's three of them there is none of their faults. So they won't take it defensively. The fact Uh that there's three of you here, you guys all set up the trace differently. And so it's hard for me, the dentist to do it three different ways. So let's do it one way. And so you and I will sit down and let's the perfect crown prep setup. What does it look like? We take a photo, we create a template. Like I like to have these, um, I got this from Aaron Nichols or whatever the guy's name is, Nicholas. And um, he has like these wipeable, like laminated things. And they like put the instruments on that thing instead of a tray. And so it's like, um, you know, you have like the spot for this instrument and you put it exactly in that spot, the spot for the anesthetic, the cotton roll, whatever. And so Uh he has this whole setup that goes directly on his countertop. And so like, here's an example of annoyance. You write it down in your notebook, Uh, assistant getting up in the middle of the procedure. And then you're like, okay, assistant, let's collaboratively work together. And right, it's not her fault, right? The reason why we're doing this is because we have three assistants, right? The reason why we're doing this is because none of them are like that great at setting up rooms, but we're not going to tell them that it's unnecessary. And so, um, you know, let's go ahead and set up a system so that we can actually properly do this. And, you know, and then you guys will work together on it. And then now you have buy-in from your staff because they were involved in the solution. And, and then you don't have the stress of three times in the middle of the procedure getting up to get something while you're sitting there waiting with a patient. It's awkward. You know, the patient's like, why are we not moving? And you're just sitting there like tapping your feet, like, come on, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Like it's annoying, (laughs) Um, you know? And, and then boom, you do that. You solve that problem once you have a system once and then you don't do it ever again. It just works. And that's the dream, George. That's the dream you're living right now. But it's not, it's not that hard. Like, I think that's the point that I'm trying to make. It's much harder to every single day deal with an inconvenience than it is to like sit down and solve it once. Yeah. And that makes like way too much sense. When you say it, they like, it's so simple. It's like, why didn't I see it eight months ago? You know? But that's fine, right? Like, don't, don't get, like, I've been really hard on you in this interview, but like, don't get hard on yourself, man. Like you're doing a great job. Like I'm like, in this point in your career, yeah. Yeah, in this, in this point in my career, a year out of school, you bought a practice that would put you in my class as number four. So I know three people other than myself that bought before you or two people other than myself that bought before you in like my dental school graduating class. So I don't even know if you're like the first in your class or not, but like in your career, you're pretty far along. Like, uh-huh. like well, remember you that me, too. You gave me false confidence, George. I thought I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, goof. That's funny. Um, you are ready. You know, it's just like you're learning on the job. That's funny. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> And it's a small office, like low overhead. The rent on this building is only like, or my yeah. mortgage is so like, like 1400 a month. So it's like- I've ripped you pretty, pretty well good numbers. because like for me, it's funny and I just enjoy doing that in real life too. So, you know, like I've yeah. had a good time with that. But in the reality is like in your career, you're really far along. Like you have a practice, you've grown it a little bit, you know, in production, not in collections, obviously. Um, but like, you know, you're moving along. You got a small AR issue that we're going to sort through. You got, you know, and then, and then it's like, okay, so let me just, like, you have good problems. All of your problems are internal. Those are great Mm -hmm. problems to have. The worst problems are if you did not have enough patients to reach your goals and were in Idaho. And then I'd be like, well, crap, this sucks because like everything is dependent on a marketing technique. But for you, you have very little that's dependent on outside factors. It's just you organizing your clinical life, organizing the workflow of your practice, and, um, you know, organizing your staff a little bit better. And then like, you know, just hiring a couple people, like then you're, there you are. That's not that hard to do, you know, like mm-hmm. you have a lot of opportunity here and, um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard not to, to feel like this is a very doable situation. And, you know, I mean that, that for me, that would feel motivating, right? 
Like everything you need to reach your goals is within your four walls. Like that to me is really empowering. Yeah. Uh, and that's honestly, that's honestly good to hear. Cause I feel like kind of out of control, like, Holy crap. Am I cut out for this? Am I going to like end up having to sell this practice and move to Alaska or <laughs> yeah, no, man. somewhere? you got everything you need in there, right? Like you just got to organize a few things, but it's really not that much. Like you you haven't done a whole lot of work in the practice. You've said that yourself, you know? So roll up your sleeves for the next six months, get to work, you know, make it like, you know, you walk through my practice, right? And you were like, man, like you can tell, right? When I give the tour, every part of the practice, I totally changed right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's, it's funny. I walked in and my staff, like, I, I think I've said this on air before. And uh, my hygienist told me that she cracked up when she heard it, but it was like, I, like I walked in and told them I wasn't going to change ever, anything. And I changed everything. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like I literally changed every single thing about the office and realistically everything was done within like a six month span. Um, so, you know, like for the most part, you know, but you have a, like, you have your, a lot of years to do this. So you can do it at your own pace. If you want to go my pace, you can do it all in six months. If you don't want to do it all at my pace, then you do it slower. But like, it can be done and then it'll just, and then it's just there. But everything you need to reach your long-term goals is within your four walls. Um, whether it's team performance, organization, um, everything. Like you don't need anything externally to reach your goals. You just got to have it set up for you, you know, properly. So I think to me, there's nothing more empowering than that. Yeah, that's good to hear. Because, uh, yeah, I honestly question, like, probably just like an hour ago before we are talking, like, man, am I cut out for this? Can I do this? You know, just like self-doubt. Yeah, and self-doubt is like, that's totally normal, right? Like, would you believe me if I told you that I like have like crippling self-doubt like a lot? No, George, I wouldn't believe it. Well, it's true. So I'm being serious. So, yeah. Like, you know, everybody so, has yeah, that. So, yeah, I... And I, so I just coasted into this practice and things were fine until like the, till the blood flow stopped, till the cash flow like has stopped. And, uh, yeah. And then I start like questioning myself and then, man, where was I going with that? I told you English is my worst language. No, you're I totally good. just, well, you doubt yourself. Right. And then that's when the doubt creeps in when kind of cash flow dried up and then you started feeling like you failed as an owner. Right. Oh, here it is, George. So like listen in to to Derek Williams on this podcast or on, on shared practices, you know, he's like, yeah, I bought the, bought the office and I lost 20 pounds. And like, I was just stressed (laughs) out of my mind. I'm like, I bought my office and it was like a dream, you know, for the first until the cash flow stopped. (laughs) And then I'm like, what the heck is going on? And then like, now I'm losing sleep at night. And now I'm like questioning myself. And like, so I'm like, so laid back and, like if everything's fine and working, I just don't question it. But yeah, which is a good anyway. sign, right? That's how you're going to handle it once you get the AR situation handled, right? Yeah, like I want to keep my blood pressure low. I want to like live. A I long lost time. ten pounds, and realistically, like nothing went wrong. Like, uh huh. It just, I just, that's how. That's with, with that level of aggressiveness, did we approach that project? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that has yeah. nothing to do with you that's just we're weird you know like derek and i just approached it with this like right like totally weird way and well i've been yeah yeah so like i think it's a gift that you were super calm and collected in your first six months of ownership i've been trying to have balance you know career yeah i finally started going to the gym four years of dental school one year residency like just totally neglecting myself so i finally hit the gym when i had some money to pay for it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know like it's been awesome at, my kids are young it's awesome to have time with them at home like not have to be gone for 80 hours a week so i think i just kind of enjoyed that maybe a little too much and i don't think i even have to invest a ton more time i just have to be smarter with like and you can pretty much do about. all of this stuff during your lag time in the office like don't uh-huh. come in on the weekends do all this stuff while you're there and just knock it out yeah yeah, I should there. just I should just put in a forty hour week every once in a while, like the majority of people do. <laughs> Not Dennis, but 
just yeah, like, but uh, like just the time that you're clinically at the office, like you're in between patients, you have like a half hour right. where like you're probably not going to be needed very much. Just knock out something and just you, right, keep that list going. And quite, you know, quietly, you'll start knocking it out and you'll start feeling a lot less stressed throughout the day. And then the idea of another hygienist or the idea of another assistant it won't feel so overwhelming to you because you won't be so bogged down by three times getting up in the middle of the procedure to get an instrument, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, so, that makes sense. And like that three times to get up in the middle of the day to get instruments happening all the day and you just don't notice yet. But once you start writing these things down and looking for them, they're going to start popping out to you. Like I, I do an exercise with clients about delegating. If you can imagine that's something we talk about. And, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> so I, you know, I'm like, start noticing. And we do the notebook exercise. And they write down in their notebook, you know, areas that they'd realize that they're doing something that can be delegated to a staff member, like filling out a lab slip or writing a clinical note or, you know, all of these little things too that you're also doing that don't need to be done and they're not in the Idaho state laws. So there's a lot of areas that, you know, I think if you start looking for them, you'll start finding them of areas that you can alleviate your stress within your legal limits and um, uh-huh. not have to hire additional staff and, you know, that whole thing but uh, just create more ease throughout the day. And then, then your goals will seem more doable with your schedule. Yeah. yeah, something you said in a previous episode that really stuck out to me was something to the effect of, I, I do, like, I have to force myself or like really, I think that was the wording, like I make myself not do things that someone else can do. Even if I just am like sitting on my hands, like, if someone else can pack cord or like fill out that lab slip or whatever it is, like I just don't do it. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about that the last couple of days and I found myself doing things like. So how many things second. did you notice? Oh, just a couple things a day. Yeah. Like I was filling out, I was packing, I was packaging up a lab box to send and I'm like, <laughs> why am I doing this? And usually I don't, but just like, yeah, just the way it worked out. Like I think I felt a little guilty because I kept the assistant the night before, like, forever because the patient had a demon tongue and it took forever to do that crown prep and so she just had to jet so i found myself the next morning like it was a different assistant i didn't want her to come in and and like have to clean up last night's mess you know or like do what should have been done last night so i was doing it but i was like man i should just not do this we'll figure it out it's funny like if you think about how many thousands of dentists listen to the show and like obviously you listened and you just had that, like, I wonder how many people just start thinking, especially after this segment, they're going to be like, man, I shouldn't be doing this right now. I'm just going to be making like <laughs> hundreds of thousands of team members around the world doing much more work because of me. <laughs> that would make me feel so accomplished in my career. Because of me, people now do more work and dentists do yeah, less work. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said too, when I was at your office, like, it's awesome when I have a staff member come in and into my office and cry because that's like a growth moment. That's when, you know, I could tell them how good of a job they're doing. And I know I'm pushing you hard, but that's because I know you can do it. And like, I have had zero of those experiences, you know, (laughs) besides my front desk, like she didn't cry, but she's like, Hey, I'm drowning here. But everyone else is like pretty cush. They're like down, you know? So. Yeah, I can, I can safely tell you that I have um, 10 employees and you know, one of them is new, so I haven't had seen, but like all but two of them I've seen cry. And uh-huh. I don't think I have like particularly emotional women in my practice. We change things up. We push, you know, we do things new. We, they take on tasks they've never done before. And yeah, that brings up stuff. I have so many of those stories and I love them. I mean, those are like my favorite moments, you know? And, and then again, like, right. I think that also speaks to the relationship I have with my team where they feel comfortable coming to me in that moment when maybe for other people, they might go to the bathroom or they might um, uh-huh. go outside or something like, you know, they come into my office and they want to talk about it. And I take that as a compliment and I never pass up that opportunity. And like, you know, it's, it's a fine line, right? I think Matt and I kind of, um, I feel sometimes a little misunderstood when we talk about it because, you know, I delegate a lot, but I don't delegate a moment like that. Or I don't delegate, you know, training my staff, or I don't delegate things that are not uh-huh. on repetitive basis. They're like more like team building leadership stuff. Like, no, that stuff is me. And, you know, the, the staff member crying in my office, I love that. Like, <laughs> I'm almost a little upset that it doesn't happen as much anymore. You know, like it, it, it is enjoyable. Like that does not drain my energy <laughs> at all. That, that is a very, that is a very energizing 
part of my day because it's never right. If it's, if it's like, a, I could see it being draining if it was like, I'm crying because like the other assistant called me fat or something like something really stupid. I'd be like, yeah, this is dumb. Right. But like yeah. most of the time they're crying because they're trying to do a really good job and they can't, or the patient made them feel bad or um, like, it's always something that like you kind of respect. I don't know. You're like, yeah, I mean, if that happened to me, I'd be a little upset too. I don't know if I'd be crying, but like I would be upset. And uh-huh. I, I just enjoy that. Yeah. Or like, you know, like we have other staff members. And so sometimes they feel like they're not as good as the other person. And that, that sometimes is hard for them, but like, and then you kind of show them areas where they're really great. And yeah, I, I just love those moments. No, that's, those are like some of my favorite moments in ownership because you grow as a team, like you, you, your bond with that employee grows. And that's like my favorite yeah. part of the whole thing. Yeah. I think uh high emotion can lead to like high connection or like, you know, yeah. And those Something are growth, like those are growing moments. And those are moments yeah. that your team knows that you're there for them. You know, like there's yeah. the all the intense leadership books. I'm I'm kind of like rolling my eyes as I'm saying it, right? Like the whole like military teaching us how to run a dental office like idea, like I'm gonna learn extreme ownership or whatever it is so that I can learn to run my like brick and mortar dental office. But like, you know, that idea that like, you know, people in the military, they like have that, they know that they have each other's back, you know, uh-huh. and and like in that dental office, like, we, like we don't have very many opportunities like that, but you know, when your staff members are showing vulnerability and like really needing some emotional support, like showing it to them goes a long way long-term and their uh-huh. buy-in on stuff that you do is a lot greater. So um, anyway, total tangent, but uh, a good one, a good one. <laughs> so I guess I kind of want to wrap things up more on the, uh, you know, I guess what are some of your takeaways from this conversation that you had today? Oh, um, yeah, I think, well, AR, of course, I got to get on top of that. Yeah. And that, that's, a good um, one. I think too. Yeah. It's good to hear. I mean, I never knew, I, I assume, but it's good to hear that the practice is sustainable. I've got a good practice and like, I'm surprised that you feel like I can grow so much and I trust it coming from you because you can get a lot of advice from a lot of people, but yeah. Anyway, I think you've got the you've got the numbers there and you've seen this enough. I think that gives me a lot of motivation to just buckle down and work hard and reach my goals. Um, yeah, I feel like if I were you taking away one conclusion, it would be my location is the last thing holding me back. Yeah. Right? It's like all of your own stuff is holding yeah. you back and your location really has nothing to do with it. I mean, you might, like if you're doing 85, 90 and you haven't quite hit 100, then yeah, maybe we can look at things again. And if, if we see your, your areas are performing much better, then yeah, maybe we can start blaming new patient flow. But at this point, no. Everything you need to reach your goals is within your four walls. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's awesome. So do you want me to go over my other takeaways? or Please. I think that, I mean, you, you kind of hit the, that was like the climax and now it's kind of, but anyway, <laughs> so here, uh, <laughs> hire, um, hire enough people to get the job done. I think was a big takeaway. Good. Um, it was also surprising to hear that almost half my practice is overdue for recall. Cause that's, I think the easiest patient to capture is not a new patient, but a patient that's already been to the practice before. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's so not yeah, almost half of your practice. It's more than half of your practice. 52% of your practice is not up to date on their cleanings. Oh, I thought you said 40%. So 40% are overdue for recare and 11% are not on any recare. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, oh. in, unless you have 10% of your patients have dentures, like, yeah, pretty much there's a lot of patients that, <laughs> yeah. So your, your opportunities within your four walls to get people in for cleanings is, is pretty, pretty big. Yikes. Okay. Man, that's crazy. Um, I think too, like, yeah, I want to work on just perfect my craft with case acceptance. If half of the new patients that walked in here didn't schedule, there's, we're dropping the ball somewhere. Um, so I, a case acceptance, that was not a case acceptance thing. That was more of a um, scheduling their next appointment, like a, their next cleaning, for example. Uh-huh. So your oh, gotcha. case acceptance is actually a big strength of yours. Okay. Well, so. Good. That is why I wanted to, so um, in my mind, right, like what is the biggest value 
that we provide with metrics. It is our ability to create focus, right? I looked at your practice. I like, I think sometimes we take for granted how much information we're able to glean about you and your office just from looking at a computer screen, right? Like I, I, you know, I knew that it's possible within your four walls and then we were able to address the reasons why it's not happening. So we were Uh able to unfold all these other reasons that you're not reaching your goals that have nothing to do with metrics or numbers because we had your numbers. And in your email to me, you mentioned your case acceptance was a problem and your case acceptance is actually very great and your diagnosis is pretty solid. So like, I'm, I don't want you to worry about that at all. I just want you to keep doing what you're doing and what the metrics really offer you is focus. So I want you to stay focused on process flow, you know, having the capacity mentally to get around the idea of more team members and another hygienist. Uh-huh. So like that's the focus I want you to take from today. And obviously AR, like it's like AR first, second, third, and these are fourth, fifth, and sixth, <laughs> you know, but yeah. like still um, the AR situation should sort itself out. But just that idea that like, I think the metrics offer us focus. Like I don't know if anybody yeah. else without numbers, without practice by numbers in the way we do it, could look at your practice and so quickly and, and give you that. And I think that is... Um, that is the the most valuable thing is you not worrying about case acceptance is you don't worry about anything else. You don't worry about, you know, marketing right now. You worry about the things that are, are indirectly in front of you. Uh huh. Yeah. That's so awesome. what, what else did you take away? Um, I told you I have a bad brain. So I wrote down one more thing and it's to get a notebook and just like keep track of, Good. of, uh, this. And I'm going to re-listen to the podcast, honestly, when this comes out and, uh, and yeah, probably take some more notes on it. But yeah, those are my main takeaways from today. Good. I, I really enjoyed this, Alex. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you. I want to acknowledge you before we close. And you know, I, you know, it, when you rip on somebody a lot, um, it can sometimes get carried away. And like, I think it's always good to have like, and, and right, that's the purpose of the show. It's educational for the audience. They uh-huh. got to learn. Um, I find the the ripping a little entertaining. You were okay with it, so I went with it. <laughs> Um, but I'm the like, first. I'm the first to admit my fault. So, yeah, and like that's a great okay. thing to have. And I think like you need to counterbalance that, though, right? You're like really great at admitting your faults, but you're also not very great at admitting your successes <laughs> or the things you're good at. Oh, and you need gotcha. to counterbalance that a little bit. So, like, I thought you were going to say, but you're also not doing anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are right. I mean, you're here with me. That's a step. And you right. know, two days ago, you guys started working on the AR. That's a step. You know, <laughs> keep taking steps. You yeah. know, um, you're right. You're not like, you're not the most proactive person about this, but like at the end of the day, like, you know, you've accomplished a lot so far in your career and you're a practice owner this early in your career. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said about that. And, you know, you have the vision and the foresight to, to want more and you're, you're doing it. Like everyone goes at their own pace. And I think sometimes the, um, the people who are successful are teachers of stuff because you know it they've shown the ability to do it but then uh-huh. again that gets so i think the audience gets this false sense of normal um you know like Derek williams is not normal you know he's extraordinary he's an animal yeah, yeah. He's so awesome. so that needs to be acknowledged for what it is so like well i'm like this is you saying like in an area where you've kind of self-proclaimed you don't care a whole lot about you know like you're like, I don't care a lot. Like my priorities are kids, family, good. That those are great priorities to have in life. You know, so like third or fourth priority on my list is like, that'd be like me saying like, I'm really bummed out that like, I don't have a six pack and I'm not like jacked because like when I compare myself to somebody who's like very successful exercising, which is their top priority, then like I don't stack up. Well, it's like, okay, but you also don't work out. And um, it's also not very important to you. So like, why are we getting up? And like, they're like a freakishly strong person. So like on a lot of levels, that comparison doesn't make sense because your priorities are not the same as Derek's. And I'm not saying Derek isn't a family guy. Like you could use me as the example, right? Like, um, but like you didn't put in the time that Derek put in, right? You haven't been to the gym as much as he has if we're talking about physical fitness. And, um, and then like, Boy, yeah, you know, and maybe I spend too much time in the gym now. Cause like, yeah, about four days a week. I could be in here like looking at AR or whatever. But well, I'm using the gym, the gym as a metaphorical analogy, right? Like we're yeah, doing the exercise thing. And I'm just you know, thinking. but like, you know what I mean though? Like, right. so like 
it'd be like me comparing myself to somebody really buff and feeling bad about myself. But like the reality is that person's just really buff and has nothing to do with my physical fitness. It's like, you're doing great, uh-huh. you know, and, and Derek is just an animal and he just killed it. And so like, good for Derek, but like that has nothing to do with Alex. And, right. um, you know, you're, you're doing great. And it, so I, I think our audience sometimes like, I, I want, I want to say that enough because I think the, the comparison, you know, like comparison is a thief of joy is that expression, right? English is my first language and that's like an idiom. <laughs> And yeah. so, uh, you know, like comparison is a thief of joy. Like, yeah, don't get sucked into that or try not to, right? Um, uh-huh. Because the reality is like, you're doing great just the way you are. And we've identified a few areas to improve. Cool. Everyone has those. You know, I'm actively trying to improve a lot of areas in my life. And this is the area you're trying to improve it in your life. So, mm-hmm. you know, like you're doing fine. And I, I don't want people to get sucked into the idea that if I'm not George Hariri or Macarino or anything, then... I'm not anything. And that's not the reality. You're a lot and um, you should be proud. Well, thanks, George. I, I don't know if my uh, loops are going to fit after today with this head swelling. (laughs) All right. We're going to end it at that. That's awesome. (laughs) Thanks for coming on, Alex. This was fun. (laughs) Thank you, George. And uh, I want to say this, I said in the email, but I'll just say it. Uh, Thank you. And to those like you that are paving the way for dentists like me, that it doesn't come You know, like you guys have paved the way for practice ownership. And now that I'm in practice ownership and uh, like it doesn't end there, like it's still, there's still this ongoing support and resource that's available at our fingertips to improve our lives and have more time to reach our other goals in life besides just our dental office. So thank you. And thanks to Matt and thanks to Richard. You guys are awesome. Thanks, man. Really, really appreciate it. You betcha. Welcome back. Here's Matt, and we're going to go through this outro with Alex. Matt has a lot of thoughts. I thought this was a lot of fun to record, as you guys probably could tell from the interview. Yeah, you crushed this, George. Like Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I think you really got him to re reframe what is going on in his office uh, and give him a new lens to look through and something that's full of opportunity, whereas when he came to you, it was full of like, this is a huge problem. I don't know how to, I'm, I'm getting out of this. Um, and one of those was in regards to his area. Like he, he, like I've heard a lot of dentists say like, but my area is really competitive. You know, I'm in Idaho, there's tons of dentists and kind of using that as an excuse. And he was, he was, he, he even voiced that he knows that's an excuse. Um, but still he was letting that affect, uh, his results. So you were framing him to get like everything you need is inside your practice already. Like you just need to improve some efficiencies, maybe get a staff member and then you're, you're on track. So I, I loved how you kind of reframed his mind in that way. And it wasn't like I was blowing smoke up, you know, his, you know what, it was just, it just, that's what the metrics were telling me. It was telling me that in fact, the issue is not his area. It is just him which is a much easier thing to, to work on than his area, right? You can't move your practice as easily as you can change the way you think about things. And I think another, another place you reframed him was like his ultimate vision and where he wanted this office to go. You know, he said 800 and you're like, that doesn't really seem like what you really want. Like nothing on the table. What do you actually want? And that's when we got to the more of the million number, which seems like million in three days was like his end point where he would be totally satisfied. Um, and I think that's back to what we talked about in a previous episode of like, he's feeling tapped out. Like he's fully busy. His schedule's full for three weeks. Like I can't do any more dentistry. I'm at, you know, 50,000 a month. How am I going to get to a hundred thousand if I'm already tapped out? And that's again, that, that efficiency issue he has, the systems, the delegating. Um, it sounds like he's up against it a little with the crazy assistant laws in Idaho. That was something. Can he make a temporary? Yeah, that's um, insane. Uh, just insane. But, uh, you know, there's plenty of other avenues to explore that he can, he can not work as hard and still grow the practice, you know, double it. I know that this is an ownership show, but I do want to make a pre-ownership point. Look at the laws in the state that you want to practice in for what you can delegate clinically. I honestly, <laughs> that would be my number one determining factor for where I practice. Just my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, we disagree there. I mean, as you said in the interview, like, you want to like where you live, right? You don't want to like, oh, I know dentists in state X make a lot of money. I'm going to go there. Like, 
that kind of thinking, which I think is a little prevalent, is something I don't agree with. I'm with agree. you there. I think you have to like where you live, 100%. Yeah. But I also think you have to acknowledge before you choose to live there, what am I going to be doing clinically on an everyday basis because I live in the state? I think you should just at least know. Yeah. Yeah. Like and in like Texas, you have to give every block. A hygienist cannot give a block. Or is that New York? Too. Oh, wait. Yeah. No, hygienist can't even give anesthesia. That's, and, that's something. That's yeah. not okay. So you have to numb up all your SRPs, you know, like just know that I'm choosing to live in Texas and I'm going to get all my patients numb. Just and know. if it's like, and that's a good, like uh, if you were choosing between two States, like that's, that's the deciding factor would be the state that has more or less yeah. laws about that kind of thing. For sure. Um, and I love the exercise you do. Uh, and I think I'm going to steal this uh, writing down the list of annoyances that come up. Mm-hmm. Cause like, it's so easy to brush them off. Like an assistant doesn't have an instrument ready you get a little frustrated in the moment and you forget about it. And then, you know, it keeps happening and it keeps delaying you. And that, that time adds up. But if you're writing those things down, you're realizing them, you're taking ownership of them. And then you're giving the training that's needed to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And this is where my being relentlessly lazy benefits me because if I have to do something once, it'll annoy me more than the average person <laughs> by a lot. And it motivates me enough to not want to do that thing ever again. <laughs> and obviously I'll do it again at some point, but I'm much more motivated to create a long-term solution. So I know that that issue doesn't happen again. And that's where my list comes in. Yeah. See, I get very annoyed in the moment and I really care in that moment. And then I compartmentalize and then it's gone. And then I just, I've been like, my short-term memory is terrible. And then it's just, I just forget about it. And then it happens again. And I kind of remember it happening before that, but I don't see the pattern. So you write that down. Like there's no avoiding it now. You yeah. It's on the list. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, I loved how you um, got him to see how how amazing he's doing just for what he's already done. Like him being an owner so quickly out of school, and you know, for my class of two two hundred, he would have been the first owner. Like that in and of itself is pretty crazy. Really? Yeah. His no one timeline was a year and a half out. School? No, he was he did a residency first, right? He did residency and then he bought right after. That still would be yeah, that still would be the that. first acquisition in my class. Really? Yeah. Uh, you know, any of my classmates listening, high five guys. You know, we are at I think we're at seven owners in I believe the first eighteen months. Yeah, that's really great. We we were just getting our first there was probably one or two before me, and I was about um th- about eighteen months out of school. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, we, we've, I mean, obviously I was first, but then Ike was right behind me a couple months later. And then we just had, yeah, I think within a year we probably had five. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not normal. I think Midwestern is very advanced and you're the business training you get. And then, you know, just knowing you and Richard and, you know, the Davises and all the great graduates you have from that school is like a true advantage. Yeah, that, I think the culture there is very strong in practice management. I think it has a lot to do with the, the student body than it has to do with the curriculum. Yeah. I'm sorry, Midwestern faculty, but I really don't think you guys have much to do with it. <laughs> We're having a dental faculty that's right up my alley, George. Gosh, <laughs> I could do a whole episode on that. I think we should at some point just rip our dental school instructors. Please. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, get, get on my soapbox and go. thinking people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then again, you know, we've said this, we've said this kind of thing before of like, you look up to someone who's doing really well and you think that everything is just easy for them, right? Like they are having a successful practice. They have a, you know, a satisfying personal life. Like everything is working for them. They can't have any doubt, right? They have it all figured out. They're where I want to be. But then you, you know, put that in a loudspeaker and I was, uh, you know, very vulnerable of you, George, that, you know, you have this self-doubt as well. And that's something you deal with always. And I think that's important for people to know that like, even the most successful people are, they're just like you, like they, they deal with their emotions and their fears. And, um, but they have found a way to not let those be the driving force. Like they're, your fear is not at the wheel. You acknowledge it, you deal with it, you talk through it, but it's not driving your decisions. Did I talk about that in this episode? Mm-hmm. In what context can you remind me? So you said that, um, you have crippling self doubt and you were like, this may be a shock to you, but I deal with that. Yeah. So I, I, can I, can I rant on that a little bit? Sure. So yeah, I, I suffer from self-doubt if we want to call it that. For me, it's a feeling of not being good enough, kind of reoccurring in different parts of my life at different times of my life. And I've recently read a book that Matt's wife turned me on to, who we've heard on the show now, so I can talk about Ellen. And she's turned me on to this book called The Dark Side of Light Chasers. 
I believe is what it's called, by Debbie Ford. And it helped me really explore that relationship with my self-doubt. And I've always viewed myself as successful in spite of my self-doubt. And I think you'll hear that when you listen to this episode. If I'm talking about it at the time of recording this, I had yet to read that book most likely. But I really feel that I am successful because of my self-doubt, as ultimately as the driving force behind the insane amount of effort that I put into certain things was that fear of not being good enough. And that ultimately drove me to want to work really hard so I don't have to deal with the reality of not being good enough. And so I think in general, anytime we have a negative quality about ourselves that's crippling, not only does everybody have them, but it's using it in a way to motivate you and to drive you forward and to give it what it needs, which in my case, it's coming on air and not, not running away from the fact that I call myself successful. You know, that is not easy to do for me because I have self-doubt, but it's an area that shows personal growth. I think if you listen to me on air over the last three years, you'll see my – I can see and hear my journey with my self-doubt as, you know, as I talk. So it – um yeah, it, to think that I'm not human would be insane. You know, it, it we are very human, and it's just how we react to it and how we deal with it that ultimately sets us apart as a whole. For people who haven't read the book, the exercise he's pointing to is you're given a list of a lot of positive and negative qualities, and you write down the ones you can't own about yourself, right? The ones that you, like, I don't feel that I'm annoying. Like, So you write that down and say, you know, I don't own that. And the book is getting you to accept all those parts of you because all humans are everything you are all those things and the things you can't be with are the ones that are the things holding you back and it's about being okay with them and allowing space for them and and thanking them for the gifts that you they have given you like for george his self-doubt has given him this drive to work really hard to be successful to be extraordinary and uh he has come down to realize that which is super powerful yeah and i think we associate all qualities as positive or negative, but qualities in of themselves are neither positive or negative. They're, they have positive and negative attributes, right? The mm-hmm. self-doubt has a lot of positives and has a lot of negatives. But I think ultimately, and this is a whole other topic, probably a whole episode, but you know, I think to for me it's hard, but it's something I want to do more and more of is be more vulnerable on air because I think it be- benefits people. The more I hear, the more messages I get about it, the more I see the value in it. And so if I could help people in that way, then great. You know, it's just not easy, but you learn to get, you know, it becomes easier, I think, with time. Yeah. It's like exercising a muscle. All right, guys. Do you have anything else you want to add, Matt? No, I think we, I think we covered it. All right. This was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed this two-part series. Alex is a really cool guy. And I just want to acknowledge him for letting me rip on him for two straight episodes. You know, he was a really good sport about it. And he's going to be really successful with what he does. For sure.